All right, I'm going to get started here. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Autumn Holmes Saltzman. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm the uh, agronomy specialist for Southern Alberta with the Canola Council of Canada. I just started back in February, and before that I was a winter wheat agronomist. So um, feel free to ask me as many questions as you can. If I can't answer them, I will write them down and I will definitely get back to you, but I do appreciate a lot of questions and interruptions. Um, so I guess I'll lead this station and if I think Ken might help me out a little bit as well with uh, some of the stuff about the plot. So he, who here has heard of UCC? One. All right, excellent. So UCC stands for the Ultimate Canola Challenge. Well, that would have cut out a lot of my time in my presentation if you guys already knew what it was. So um, it stands for the Ultimate Canola Challenge and basically it started as this idea um, that we came up with over beers about having a head-to-head -head battle royale between um, production systems. So we were going to have Neil Harker and Murray Hartman face off and see who could have the best canola crops. Uh, but both of them agreed they'd probably just consult with each other and do the same thing anyways. So um, we ended up changing the, the scope of the project a little bit. And it basically evolved into a bit of a a way for us to get some data on a lot of products that we get asked about. So um, we wanted to basically, we wanted to demonstrate what happens when you do everything right with canola. And then we also wanted to test a few products on top of that that we've been getting asked about. So there's a lot of, a lot of products, all sorts of primers or micros or foliar or whatever application that um, we're getting a lot of calls about, but we don't really have a ton of data on. So this is a great way for us to be able to answer questions in a knowledgeable fashion. And also to demonstrate that, you know, if you want to spend an extra five or ten dollars an acre, sometimes bumping up your seeding rate or bumping up your nitrogen for something that's, you know, a guaranteed return might be a better investment. That being said, if some of the products that we're testing do have a result, we know that that's something that we should be looking at in the future. Um, the UCC plots are at ten sites across Alberta. This one and Lethbridge are in southern Alberta and the rest are, are further north. And we have 13 treatments at most of the sites, but some of them just have six. So we've got one to six as sort of a program for some of the ARAs that didn't have enough time to put the full 13 in. And then the 13 are for guys like Ken who um, just love working and want to want to seed more canola. So um, we've got enough plots and they're all replicated that we think we can get some actual statistical analysis out of this, which is excellent. Um, so let's see. So to pick our fertility, basically we, Ken did some soil tests and then we, we sent the results around between a group of us agronomists and Murray Hartman and Neil Harker and, and came up with a recommendation. And I think what went down here, Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, was 70 pounds of nitrogen, 20 pounds FOS, and 5 pounds sulfur? Is that what we did? Right. Yeah, okay, so, um, and then as far as the variety goes, we specifically kept our noses out of the variety question. Um, we didn't really want to be picking one over the other, so we let every site pick whatever they wanted. Um, so I'm not even sure what this variety is. Maybe you can ask Ken, but I don't know if we're even going to talk about it. it. Yeah. The there you go. <laughs> um, so, what am I missing, Ken? I think that, oh, and walking through this pl these plots already this morning, they all look pretty similar. The only one that I think looks visually different to me, Ken said the extra seeding rate might. I think the the um, the UAN in the springtime looks a little better just because you guys have had a lot more moisture than usual. So maybe that crop, we fertilized for a 30, 35 bushel crop. And now that you've got some moisture, there's some more potential. So what we can do is take a little walk down, um, take a look through the plots and sort of discuss if you think that there is anything different between each of them. Um, I can go through each plot as we go, I don't know about carrying this thing, or if I can just, okay. So the first one is the standard seeding rate. We used 100 seeds per meter squared, which is about, um, in small plot you have a little bit better, um, better emergence typically, but uh, based on 60% 60 60 emergence, you would have six plants per square foot. Um, going a little higher than that, we'd, we'd ideally want between 7 and 10 plants per square foot, but this is a pretty realistic good management practice. Um, so this has the standard seeding rate and it has um, the standard fertility. So that was that 70 pounds of nitrogen. Um, I guess I'll just walk for a bit. Uh, this is going to be tricky. Yeah, I got it. That's okay. So then we have our extra nitrogen at seeding time. 
So our 100% was 70 pounds per acre of nitrogen, as I said, and then our 125% was 87 and a half pounds per acre of actual N. So between this one and the first one, somebody can come up and take a look at them and let me know if you think. Thanks. What do you think? Do you think there's much of a difference? Like you can take a little bit of a walk in there, but. Yeah. Okay, and then moving down to the next one here, we have a seed primer, um, and we're not. Tr I'm not trying to bash any products at all. This isn't about that. So um, just we have them named in the trial here, but this is a Protonus seed primer. Um, in the plots in Lethbridge and across the prairies, we haven't really seen too much for response yet, and this one I think is is the same. Uh, I guess it'll all come down in in yield time to see what responded and what didn't. Uh, this product is called C3 Stress Relief. Um, it's a combo of micros and it was applied on June 14th. I don't really see too much of a difference and this sort of mirrors the, the Lethbridge results as well. But like I said, I mean, you can't really tell until it's in the combine. So this is the one I thought might look a little bit better. Um, it's a little bit darker. It doesn't have as many of the yellowing senescing leaves on the bottom. But it's really tough to say at this stage, hey? Like, it's, it's not the easiest thing to gauge. And then we've got boron at flowering July 12th. How many of you guys use boron? Yeah? Bor when do you apply it? My son is not here. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a couple. Boron is one of the, the the products that we get questioned about quite a bit. So we really wanted to include a couple different treatments. And we have boron at flowering, and then we have another one that I believe was uh, earlier, I think it was around four leaf that's further down. Um, this product is uh, Neil Harker's favorite. It is a foliar application that is supposed to make your plants um, uptake CO2 better and increase your yield exponentially. So we'll see how that one does, but at this point in time, the plant counts and everything sort of seem to be similar to the rest. This one we've got reduced nitrogen at seeding, which might be a little bit thinner, a little spindlier. Do you guys think there's any differences so far, or what is everybody? I'm going to pick on somebody. What do you think, Doug? Thinner. Thinner? What about the other ones? Yeah. And then this is another seed primer uh, called Proceed. It is a micro combination. Let's see, who others? What other names? Laverne, what do you think of this one? Does it look any different? My taste on this one is better. Yeah. This one is a biostimulator that is applied, uh, it was applied on June 5th and I think it goes on in about in two applications, one at the three to four leaf and one around the six leaf. Um, so far there haven't been too much for, I mean it was a later applied so the plant counts wouldn't be different. So this will be one we'll wait for yield as well. And the Farming Smarter crew are out here doing plant counts every week and there's a few things. We've sort of developed a protocol with, with Murray Hartman and Neil Harker and us agronomists to make sure we're harvesting a lot of data, taking a lot of pictures so that we do have, have some, some results to go back to. This is a foliar, fo fortified foliar. Um, it was applied on June 18th. And I think it just sort of gets to the point where, what do you guys think? Who else do I know in here? Uh, hey, Seedmaster, what do you think? <laughs> they're, they're all very close. Yeah. The biggest thing I see is the nice stalks are a lot thinner on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things, Murray Hartman has a, a bit of a spiel about the probabilities and maybes and what you think is likely going to work and what probably won't work um, and, and how to selectively use data. But in a lot of instances, if you see a picture of one crop that's, you know, black and white difference between the two, sometimes that can translate into a yield difference and sometimes that can't. So when you're, um, when you're thinking about which products to use, make sure you look for the actual scientific data behind it on multiple sites, like we've done here, I guess. And then the last one we've got 
is our high seeding rate. So this is one that I think looked better at Lethbridge and I think looks a little bit more even here. Obviously there's more plants per square foot. It's 150 seeds per meter squared instead of 100. So it's about a 50% increase in seeding rate. Um, and I think it looks a little bit thicker, but it's sort of, what do you guys think? Yeah. Did I miss anything, Ken? I feel like I have. I've done this presentation a few times now and I'm starting to say, repeat myself or not repeat myself. So you guys are gonna publish the, the numbers out of this? Right? Absolutely not. We're trying to figure out how, what the best way to do it is, but one of the concerns is that when we have this many sites over this many locations, likely a product is going to have a response at one of them and it might not be a statistically significant response. So we're, we bought the product from the company, so we're not providing data to anybody. Um, and we wanna be really careful about how the data is used. So likely we're going to be having something in our winter meetings where we'll be talking about the data that comes out of it. Um, and then also at Cano Lab next year, we're thinking about incorporating this, but it's a pretty sensitive topic and we, we don't want to be, we're not here to bash products, that's not what it's about. It's about, you guys are, you guys are paying for this, like farmers are all paying for this and it's about getting some real data behind some of these products that you're being sold. So we really have to be careful on how we present it and, and who we not give the, sued. not get sued, yes. So if you guys have any ideas about how to do that, that would be uh, appreciated, but. Um, so it's something that we're discussing now, but we do want to have data come out of it. We're just not sure how we're going to provide it yet. Remember that original beer party that you had? <laughs> you probably should end the same way, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All of life's problems are solved that way, right? Yeah. So do you guys have any questions for me? Or for Ken about the plots here? Or canola in general? How's everything looking? What's your, uh, I've run into some fields with white flowers. Um, we've seen a little bit of that this year and I think it's mostly been attributed to off types. That's what I've heard so far. There's, there's been a few, um, uh, what is it, albino, like there's been albino parts and leaves and stuff like that and that's, the pictures that I've seen so far have all been attributed to off types. Is it pretty regular throughout the field? Uh, yeah. Yeah. How about uh, cabbage seed pod weevil? How many of you guys sprayed for that this year? Some? Ligus bugs? How many are you guys sweeping for? Or what are you getting? Actually low. Low? Good. Okay. There's a bit of a pocket up by Vulcan that's a little higher, so. And how about sclerotinia fungicide? No? Nobody? I think back in Saskatchewan, everyone put it into their, well, their spray every year now. Yeah. And I've tried it around here and I found no advantage. I did my own little trial and mm -hmm. uh, for me it didn't seem to pay. It is a dry, dry, dry area here yeah. at the time. Except for now. Except for right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said 50, like up to 50 and turned around and just walked in. I actually took it over to everybody. Really? Yes. Okay. How many, uh, how many of you guys are actually canola growers? I'd like to get a feeling there. Okay. So I, I just flew to Edmonton and I couldn't believe how much canola is in this province and in Southern Alberta. So do you guys feel like we're a bit of a wet cycle now? Is that, uh, is that a dumb question? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, not that long ago, we didn't see canola here. So. Are, are you guys like expert canola growers now? How many? Put your hands up if you're an expert canola grower. Well, that greens. <laughs> oh, come on, you chickens. <laughs> okay, now let's see who's really brave. How many of you have actually used one of these products in this lineup here? I don't know what variety seed it is. I didn't mean variety. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the nitrogen? Yeah. No, no, not too much experimentation? Okay. 
those of you guys that have done it, are you brave enough to talk about your experiences? No results so far. Yeah. Nothing, nothing concrete that says, uh, I have to spray this on my canola every year. Not last year, anyway. Not last year. How about you, Laverne? My experiences are is that, uh, you know, you get a good base and that seems to hold its own all on its own. Mm -hmm. um, get sufficient fertilizer down there and some of these add-ons, uh, I don't find any value in them. As a matter of fact, I've experienced lower yields uh, by using them. Not much. You know, we're only talking a bushel or two, an acre kind of thing, but um, to me, I, I'm not willing to burn my money anymore on stuff like this. So, so you're not even going to experiment anymore? No. So, I think that the Medicine Hat area in general, we're pretty new at growing canola. However, in other parts of the, the province, I think that everybody's like, okay, we got to really push our yields. we got to do something different, and there's that just innate desire to try different things and and I think that's probably why like like Autumn and the rest of the CCC folks are they're really getting bombarded with with questions regarding what do you know about this way well you know what I bet you we've only got half maybe a quarter of the products that are out there right now so so for you a couple of farmers that have actually tried them on your own place how do you go about doing it? how do you evaluate it yourself with any confidence do test strips and take it to yield yeah, so, so we're using yield monitors and such? Okay. Scales. Scales. Okay. So, yeah, like, like Autumn said, we're not, um, nobody's here to say the products work or don't work, but um, we really love to at least get an idea of when it does work. So say, say you see a product, you sprayed it on, and you see a visual response. That's the problem with these plot tours, right? Let's, is there any real visual responses here? Do you see any real visual responses in your fields ever? Sometimes, yeah, there, there are lots of times where I've gone out and looked at trials where, hey, there's a visual response and they'll, they, all of a sudden now, what happens? The, the, the company has all of these claims. What are their claims? What do they, what do they say that, that's happening? Better roots. Yeah, that's, that's been a really big topic right now. Enhanced root growth, enhanced vigor. What does vigor mean? Anybody? Crap, you guys aren't expert canola growers. <laughs> well, it's a strong crop, but just a, it's intense growing, right? It's a, it's okay. Got some, it's got some gift. The word vigorous yeah. is faster, a little bit stronger, <clears throat> bigger roots maybe. That's what some of these pre-seed, uh, the, the seed primers, the, the intent there is that it's actually going to germinate faster, get out of the ground faster, compete with weeds faster. Yeah, there's all of that. Um, what I would suggest then, if you do ever get into the situation where you want to try some of these products is just go out and analytical approach. First of all, maybe we will have some data, but you know, we have to make sure that we've got enough data. I don't want to be out there and, and, and saying things don't work when they do, just as much as I don't want to say that they do work and they don't. So we've talked about this whole change in CFIA regulations. How many of you guys have heard of that? We talked about it a fair bit last year, but so so what's happening now is the government of Canada is changing its way of registering these types of products. So if it's not a herbicide that has to go through the pest management center, if it's a fertilizer type amendment or any other type of amendment that falls into that category, it used to have to be registered through the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for both environmental risk and efficacy. So now what's happened is that the requirements for efficacy data is no longer, it's gone. That means anyone can come to market with a product and make claims, as long as it's not damaging to the environment. So we can feel good that, you know, we're not going to go out there and produce a food that, you know, is shipped overseas and somebody says, wait a minute, this is crap and send it back. But there's no real requirement to say it actually works. And if you look very carefully at that label, take a look at what they're claiming. That's what I, that's the very first thing I do. If you got to have a salesman show up, what is the claim? If it's bigger, if it's enhanced plant growth, that may be real, but there may be no real economic advantage to it. So that's just like in fungicides too. You know, the whole, the whole debate of should we put a half rate of tilt with our herbicides, there may be a response. 
you may see that there's less disease on one side versus the other. But if it doesn't end up with an economic response, then there's really no point in doing it. So, so watch that label very carefully and look exactly what the claim is. And if, they, if there is no claim to yield or yield protection, then there's a chance that it might not be worth the money. So that's sort of uh, the, the rule of thumbs that we go. And, I, and, I, and I'm all for the, the, the on-farm testing. But it's tricky too because then you've got the entire variability of your farm throwing a wrench into you being able to pick out whether there's a difference or not. So I think we do actually have a little bit of work to go out there. How accurate do you guys think yield monitors are? <laughs> Anybody got an opinion on a yield monitor? They're as good as you set them up. Yeah? yeah. yeah. How good? Even after that, I've done some weighing, gone to the elevator, done some weights, come back and calibrated it. And done some more weights after that and it still wasn't close. You know, we're talking like anywhere from 10 to 20% difference. Wow. Outages. Does anyone think that you can get more accuracy on a yield monitor than 10 or 20%? Yes. A very smart man over here is saying no. I wasn't talking about you. Good. <laughs> Good. So, so if you do everything right, probably the best that you can get is in that four to five percent accuracy so then I'll tell you this if 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 a bunch of companies are coming together and they've done a whole bunch of strip trials you know there there are coordinated efforts in strip trials and then they get up there and they claim a 0.2 bushel per acre yield advantage is there any meaning to that really and I've gone through quite a few presentations like wow that looks pretty good 152 trials 0.2 per 0.2 bushels, maybe even half a bushel. Do you honestly think that that's within the realm of error? I think we have to get a pretty good understanding of what we're able to do and what's practical. It's not saying that they're wrong, but you know, there's a lot of gray in agriculture. So uh, I guess the, the words of advice, you know, don't be afraid to try things, do it on small amounts. Um, you can come and talk to us and we're always interested in trying to do these types of work. I'm very curious to see how these trials are because I know that the visual differences don't always mean anything. Sometimes we do get yield advantages. So yeah, we will do our best Laverne to, to publish the results, but we have to make sure that the interpretation of the results are valid. And that's, that's where we have to really be careful when anytime you're presented with data. So any last questions on any of these types of products or what they're used for? Or... Did you do any foliar applied nitrogen? Yes, the UAN treatment is just down this way in the first rep. But you only Not did fully ten, applied. You only did 10 gallons an acre though. Which How much do you want? No, it's only three, three pounds of N. No, it's, no, it's more than that. More than that. Oh, the I think we put 30 pounds of nitrogen down. Yeah. yeah. Three, three pounds, three pounds per gallon. Yeah. 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 And that was... So you guys... Did it 30 pounds, yeah. yeah. It says zero, Told you it wasn't yeah. smart. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, how many of you guys are playing with um, dribble banding nitrogen? You don't have to be afraid. What's, uh, how, how have you been feeling it works? I know logistically it makes a lot of sense. You guys can get over acres pretty fast. There's actually not a lot of research that on this. I've, I've found it works quite well. I mean, it, you know, I was using industrial single shoot and that gave me an option to go out back afterwards and top, topping up. Well, the guy was short, right? Okay. So you're, you're going to shoot for your average yield and then top up if you've got the moisture. So that gives you that flexibility and you've got a, an opportunity to use that very expensive high clearance spare for, for more Something else. How about you guys? Have you been Just happy started. with it? Just started? Nobody else is dribble banding high clearance sprayers? Not anymore. You used to? Yeah. Huh. We're, we're melting or we're dissolving 4600. Okay. Only might, for your cereals? Work. Everything. Really. Test plots. So the idea behind that, um, they're melting, they're melting the 4600, and in that sense, you're actually going for a foliar uptake. The dribble banding is really, truly just getting a liquid fertilizer down onto the ground for a, a, a root uptake. But there's more and more interest in in doing the urea. For one, it's actually pretty safe on the crop. It doesn't uh, it doesn't burn the crop too badly, but. Um, hoping for for protein boost. I've seen some data that's shown some decent results in protein boost, but I've never heard uh, anyone actually playing with it on canola. 
I know that uh, I think that's an area that we need to do a little bit more work on, honestly. Is Scott Mears here? Yes, he is. That's good timing, Scott. You're up. Uh, eh? Yeah. So join me in thanking Autumn for presenting this, and you're always welcome to come and take a look at these plots as long as you don't wreck them.